Hey everyone, this is Neo once again from the Overclocker magazine. So here we are, the launch of the Intel 11th gen core series of CPUs. Today with me, I have the 11900K, Core i9 that is, and the i5 11600K. Now, before we go any further, it's important that I tell you the context within which all this testing was done. Naturally, viruses prior to a platform launch come in hard and fast. And I think this is the tightest I've ever had it. L quite literally, the performance figures that I give you are a representation of a virus that came out just on Friday. So that's the 0703 virus for the ROG Maximus 13 Hero. We'll go into a review of that motherboard at a later time, but today I just wanna focus on the CPUs. So getting a BIOS update so late meant that it actually took a long time to test. I was testing virtually right up until an hour an hour ago i was actually still testing so there are no overclocking results as such we'll deal with that at a later point but right now i hope to be able to relate to you all the pertinent information regarding the 11th gen core cpus so i have my notes right here we'll get into that and yeah so without further delay from me let's get right into it so for the first time we have a brand new microarchitecture, right as i said before we've been literally living off skylake based or skylake derived architectures for geez how many generations i think since sixth generation yeah since basically 6700k and so forth so it's been quite a while so what do we have here we have brand new cypress cove cores now these are a variant of the sunny cove cores that you find on the 11th gen mobile parts but unlike on the mobile parts this is still 14 nanometer manufacturing process versus the 10 nanometer manufacturing process on the mobile parts now i'm going to go over just the basic changes so we're talking about cache we're talking about pci express lanes and we're talking about just the platform in general that's a 500 series platform the first of which is the cache so cache has actually been changed quite dramatically with the cpus so traditionally you were getting um, an l1 cache on comet lake and, be and before that was 64k in size however intel has increased the data cache from 32 kilobytes to 48 kilobytes obviously the more data you can have closer to the execution cores the better the processor performance so that's an obvious benefit the details of that you'll have to check out on a nantech or other reputable publications that go into the details and the deep dives of this but suffice to say we have a larger l1 cache but more significantly we have an even bigger l2 cache that's actually double the size of what it used to be per core so if you go back to comet lake you'll see that the l2 cache was 256k per core so you'll realize that we have double the cache amount here 512k compared to 256k on comet lake and previous I don't know what kind of latencies I incurred by doubling the cache, but hey man, Intel knows what they're doing. So I suppose the overall gain in having a larger L2 cache negates anything that we'll be losing in terms of latencies and so forth. Now, past the cache, the other thing that you might want to know about is that in terms of connectivity, basically matching what AMD is offering right now Intel has given us 20 lanes from the P from the CPU instead of the traditional 16 so we have 16 lanes that will, can be dedicated to graphics and then we have an additional four lanes that will be dedicated to storage so you have storage that's literally attached to the CPU rather than the chipset so obviously this is going to be great particularly for those high performance SSD drives that we're getting now that have read and write speeds of up to seven gigabytes a second, if not more. But it is good to know that we have finally 20 PCI Express lanes from the CPU instead of 16. And to top it off, off they are all PCI Express 4.0. So one of the other things that Intel has added for this 11th gen CPUs is AVX 512 and Deep Learning Boost, so a DL Boost instructions. Again, I'm not sure if these will be beneficial in a gaming context, but for those who do the productivity work or highly computational stuff that does require or benefits from these instruction sets, particularly deep learning as well, I'm sure you'll derive some measure of performance gain from having these native to the CPU. On the 11th gen CPUs, they've actually introduced a brand new generation 12 IGP or graphics processor. Now with that, I don't have the exact details of what's been changed, but I do know that we're going from 
24 execution units on the 10900K, 10850K and so forth to 32 execution units of the new generation 12 graphics. Just briefly talking, I didn't get to test a lot of the IGP performance, but I can tell you that it is significantly faster. Intel had claimed that the performance of the IGP on the latest generation of CPUs was up to 50% faster, and it actually is, because I think I recorded, what, 1,400 points in 3 d Mark Fire Strike using the 10th generation core CPU, and then I ended up recording something like 2,000 400 or so with the 11th gen IGP. So you can obviously tell that's about 50% uh, performance gain. We'll look at that at a later time with performance scaling of DRAM clocking and so forth. But for right for now, Intel has done quite a tremendous job in improving the graphics on the CPU. So if you are wondering what kind of pricing we're looking at with the CPUs, the MSRP, I don't know when last anything went for MSRP, but the MSRP for the 11900K is $539 and for the 11600K or 11600K, it's $262. These are not too different from what we had before, but what that translates into here in South Africa is I think 5,600 Rand for the 11600K and about 11,500 for the 11900K. So those prices are really, really aggressive and I actually expected them to be a lot more, but these are fantastic prices, especially given the kind of performance that you will be getting out of this platform, which we will get to at a later point. So one of the new things that Intel has actually brought with this 11th gen core CPU launch is a brand new IMC. So this IMC allows half rate for the IMC clock versus the memory frequency. What that means is that similar to what you get on the competitions platform, the IMC can actually run at a much lower frequency, half the frequency, therefore alleviating any limitations that might be imposed by the IMC on your memory overclocking. Imagine you were running a frequency, you wanted to run DDR5000, right? Not every motherboard could do this, not every CPU could do this, but imagine you had a motherboard that could do this, we had the DRAM that could do it, but unfortunately the CPU just couldn't do it. The reason some of the time that the CPU couldn't do it is likely due to the IMC limit. Obviously, if you cool the CPU enough, the IMC tends to perform better. However, not everybody's running sub-zero cooling or sub-ambient cooling. So that's not always possible. So prior to Rocket Lake, you would have had to run your IMC at 2,500 megahertz, which is DDR5000 when you are running your memory at DDR5000, right? But now with this gear two mode that's been introduced, it actually allows you to run the IMC at half the frequency. So half of 2,500 is what? 1,250. And I guarantee you, your IMC is gonna be a lot heavier doing 1,250 megahertz instead of 2,500. So how you would benefit from that, obviously, is on two DIMM motherboards mainly. Of course, you will benefit on four DIMM boards as well, particularly because there are four DIMM boards that are actually able to do now 5,000 megahertz and so forth. So it's no longer the case that you need specifically a two DIMM board to be able to do something useful. That said, in my experience testing with this motherboard right here, the Hero board, I actually found that I was limited to about 4,600 on my on most of my sticks I could boot 4,600 and actually get it to be quite stable which is pretty solid for a 4 dim board I haven't been able to do that before so that's fine but one of the profiles that Asus actually has on this motherboard has DDR4 5,600 now I don't know if these were copied from the Apex or they genuinely were tested on this board but that is impressive to see that this DDR4 5,600 that's actually been validated not only for just high speed runs but seemingly for 24 7 use as well granted the voltage seems to be pretty pretty high because the profile sets the voltage at um what do you call this at 1.8 volts but i think 1.8 volts should be fair considering that a lot of the memory you are getting anyway rated at 1.6 volts excuse me while i adjust my hat so this new imc actually allows itself to be configured after boot or after post. Usually if you, let's say you posted your system at DDR43200, you are stuck there. You cannot change it when you're in Windows. But this new IMC actually allows you to change 
that strap from 3200 to say, I don't know, maybe 2933 or whatever available strap there is. I didn't test this personally, but it was one of the things that Intel had highlighted in the press briefing about the new capabilities of the IMC. So if you match the ability to change clock frequency or rather memory clock frequency with an existing capacity to change the actual DRAM timings while you're in Windows, which has actually existed before, you have the most flexible IMC we've had in a very long time, if, the mo if not the most flexible IMC we've had, period. Okay, so that's really great stuff from Intel. How overclockers and others will exploit that remains to be seen. In fact, you've probably seen a lot of the DDR4 records right now. And yeah, that's all I can say. A new IMC allows some incredible things to happen. But we'll go through that at a later point. Right now, let's just get to the benchmarks and let's just appreciate what the 11th gen Core Series CPUs are offering, which is surprisingly a lot and surprisingly impressive. Let's get to the first benchmark. So there you have it, the Intel 11th gen Core Series CPU review. Now, obviously I didn't get to go through as much of the detail as I may have wanted to, but trust me, we'll be back here doing a lot more of the Z590 motherboard reviews and so forth, and I'll get to give you some of the nuances that this platform actually has. But right now it's still early days. I mean, we're dealing with beta biases as you know. You know. So things may change. I do suspect that things will get even better going forward. And you'll get to see that as the motherboard reviews come out. And as I said, the performance improves and so forth. But then again, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Remember to share, like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the flip side. Take care and peace.